detailed retellings. You've got your straight retellings, you've got your covert adaptations, your reimagining, your big story mashups. The retelling though that's going to get all the hype this year is going to be The Forest of a Thousand Lanterns by Julie Dow. Dow takes a previously straightforward character of Snow White's evil stepmother and makes her the star of the show. You remember that evil queen. The narcissistic queen with the magic mirror who she was constantly asking if that dress made her butt look fat and the mirror had to bite back its comments that maybe if she stopped binging on high protein human hearts all the time they wouldn't have to have this conversation every five minutes. I mean she was never super relatable even if you forgot about the huge human heart collection bigger than body works. So the big question about this book is if Dao can bring something new to the table and make this version of the evil queen if not relatable then memorable. The whole book kind of sinks or swims on how you feel about Shifang. The story is set in an Asian land where the dragon lords once ruled. Eventually, they had a dispute with someone called the Serpent Lord and they pieced out. The Serpent Lord believed that he should be ruling the world and apparently has been lurking around waiting for his chance to take over. So you can guess that, from the cover at least, Shifang is definitely kinda maybe involved with the Serpent Lord. Shifang lives in a small village with her abusive aunt Guma, who has read the future. Shifang will become the next empress, if she makes the right choices, that is. Choices that generally involve sacrifice and darkness and generally being a despicable person. Her aunt has a terrible influence on Shifang, encouraging her to do things by any means necessary and teaching her dark magic. But Shifang also has a good influence in the form of her secret boyfriend, Wei. Wei loves Shifang more than anything and would gladly kill her aunt Guma if it meant severing her influence on Shifang. But as much as Shifang wants to return his affection with her whole heart. She can't help but believe that love is a weakness and will tie her down and keep her from her empress destiny. Shifang has a lot of obstacles in front of her if she wants to end this book as a decent person. She has to throw off all the influence of the seductive black magic, an abusive aunt, her desire for money and power, her belief that love is no substitute for any of those things, and her frequent impulses to do violent harm to people who get in her way. Honestly, she's a barely functioning psychopath who would make Patrick Bateman a great girlfriend. Clearly this girl doesn't have a snowflake's chance in hell in getting to the end of this story as a good person. Granted, this is the story of an evil queen, so you suspect that by the end of this book she's going to lose her humanity, but there isn't a whole lot that's going to help her out in staying a good person. You never feel like she's at a crossroad. She never gives serious consideration to doing the right thing. She's on the most direct path to becoming an evil overlord. She does not pass go. She does not collect $200. For me, this is what brought the book and her character down a peg. Shifang never has a moment where she does something redeemable, and without the hope that she can actually change and become a good person, I find it hard to connect with her. As for the people around her, they either don't see her psychopathic tendencies, or are too self-involved, or just don't care much to stop her. Shifang's biggest obstacles to becoming empress are the current empress and the favorite concubine. With them out of her way one way or the other, Shifang is free to manipulate the emperor into making her empress. In order to put real tragedy into Shifang's descent into one girl's personal monster, we have to have a strong connection with the empress and the concubine. They have to be two fully formed dynamic characters. But instead, they are as bland as white bread crusted in saltines. The concubine is shallow, narcissistic, obsessed with maintaining her position, and needlessly cruel to the people beneath her. You don't even feel a smidge bad when Shifang is going to get the better of her. And the Empress checked out ages ago. All she wants out of life is to have a daughter. Literally, that's all she wants. She's a self-appointed baby vessel. She couldn't give two flying fucks what she found does as long as it doesn't bother her future female progeny. Even though the Empress is a decent person, she is only a halfway decent mother figure. She fails to make a strong enough connection with Shifeng to be a distinct obstacle in front of the throne, and she definitely fails to create a strong connection with us. I mean, it's hard to care about someone who doesn't care about themselves. So instead of having characters who actually challenge Shifeng emotionally or mentally, we have a walking baby factory and a magpie. Characters who make it easy for Shifeng to achieve her goal by being the horrible person she always knew she was. Their lack of strong opposition to Shifeng means that our ultimate investment in her character arc, arguably the most important part of the story, kind of fails. If Shifang wasn't going to be challenged by other characters around her, then having an interesting environment might provide some actual character developing conflict. Dao starts off on the right foot. She moves the Snow White story out of its traditional medieval Europe setting that is the base model for most fantasy 
stories and replaces it with the fantasy Asian setting. She even gives the land its own unique, if somewhat underexplored, mythology. She even throws in a couple of fantastical creatures for good measure. Unfortunately though, we also never really get to see a lot of this new world. Shi Feng goes from the little village through a magical forest where she meets some magical creatures and then goes on to the palace where she stays cloistered in the women's section for the rest of the book. Shi Feng is stuck in a highly domestic setting where highborn ladies sewing for fun is the highlight of their day. We get no action, no fantastical wonders within the palace, no real intrigue, no mystery. Just life going on as usual in the most uneventful part of the palace. We're just lucky that Shi Feng managed to start a feud with the concubine because she would have died of boredom if she hadn't. So without character development or conflict with almost nothing going on in her environment, to provide stimulation to her character, Shi Feng doesn't stand a chance of drawing us in like Adelina did in The Young Elites or Victor and Eli did in Vicious. The Forest of a Thousand Lanterns takes a long time to get interesting. 200 pages long. Dao does some things very well. She does lay some great groundwork for explaining the elements of the original fairy tale, like why the queen wants Snow White's heart, for example. But the problem comes with the main character. In order to pull this off, Dao really needed to make us connect with the future evil empress. Shi Feng doesn't have the right character around her or the right environment around her to really polish her up and make her shine with that lovely evil glow. Forest of a Thousand Lantern is going to be a series. Whether the next book will focus on Shi Feng is a big question. By the time that Snow White grows old enough to be a thorn in Shi Feng's side, Shi Feng will be well out of YA protagonist age. That being said, the series may benefit from having a new heroine, but only time will tell. This book is for some people, but not others. If you're looking for a well-developed female heroine in this book, you might not enjoy this book. But if you're looking for a novel that does some interesting things with a traditional fairy tale, you might enjoy Forest of a Thousand Lanterns.